Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, we've got quite a few people signed up for this today, which is absolutely fantastic. We've also got a lot of speakers, a lot of knowledge to impart and share and hopefully get some good discussion and make some good connections for discussions post event. So let's have a look at the, on the next slide at the objectives for today and to remind ourselves that actually we want to, to use today to demonstrate the role that different organisations play in supporting Scottish uh, provenance, the provenance of Scotland's food and drink. Uh, we also want to raise awareness of the food and drink research capability across Scotland. We've got some very, very talented people speaking to us today. Uh, and there's certainly not all of the research and the consultancy talent in Scotland, but there's certainly um, some of the best ones. So that's fantastic. And uh, finally, we want to start to think really about the top three things that are going to be key post Brexit for that will impact on provenance and that are, are, um, are going to impact on the work that the people that are speaking today will be doing. Uh, so we really want to start to sort of flex a bit around that. So as we're going through this, do take time to, to jot down what you think of the sort of key things and we'll, we'll hopefully bring that out in the discussion. So without further ado, I'm now going to pass on to our first speaker, who is John Davidson from Scotland Food and Drink. John is the Strategy and External Relations Director at Scotland Food and Drink. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm John Davidson, the Strategy and External Relations Director from Scotland Food and Drink. I've only been in the post for about two months or so now, and prior to that, I was um, in the food and drink team in the Scottish Government. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me here today. I think I have seven minutes, um, and I'm going to set the scene on um, this issue about where we are in the sector just now and um, some of the key issues around provenance and the provenance agenda that's going to be important going forward. So next slide, please, Callum. <clears throat> so just a bit of context to start off with. Um, we all know that we are, we have been and we are still in the middle of uh, one of the biggest global pandemics we have seen in a long, long time. And this has caused significant disruption for the food and drink sector, um, both in markets around the UK in the hospitality sector um, and because of closure of the hospitality sector and in export markets around the world. I think every country in the world has had some form of lockdown restrictions, which of course in turn has affected their ability to export uh, to those countries. So it has been a very challenging year for the industry. Um, our own modelling suggests that you know this could result in potentially up to 3 billion loss of sales, which is significant which is almost 20% of the value of the industry. So this is an enormous challenge that our industry is currently navigating. Um, of course, in, in almost just a month's time, we now have Brexit to deal with. And there's so many unknowns with Brexit that um, it's difficult to know what the impact will be. But we know the food and drink sector is going to be one of the sectors most affected by any disruption caused by Brexit. So uh, it's a very challenging environment we're in, and, and there's a, a degree of unknown going forward. But um, we have a very resilient sector, and we now have a plan which was published on Saturday to try and guide us through the coming months and years um, to help us recover from COVID and to prepare for Brexit. So there's a, there's a picture of that in front of you in the screen there. This has been developed by the industry in partnership with the public sector. Um, it sets out 50 actions. Um, short-term, medium-term actions that we're going to take um, over the coming months to try and get the industry back on track. Because ultimately, although it's a very challenging time, there are enormous opportunities out there, I think, for the industry if we plan and work together. It's based around two broad principles, stimulating more demand in more markets around the world, and then secondly, how we genuinely really support businesses to capitalise on that demand, both big and small businesses. So that's the broad um, shape of the plan. Uh, next slide, please, Carol. So that's the context we're working in. The issue of provenance, what do we mean by provenance? Because people use this phrase in different ways. And I think formally, it's about the origins of our food, how it's grown, how it's reared, how it's caught, and how it's produced. But we also think of provenance, certainly across the sector, in a few different broader ways. Uh, in terms of our quality, so our commitment to food safety, uh, our commitment to manufacturing excellence. Uh, our authenticity, um, how our products are unique, uh, how our standards are extremely high, and how connected we are to the country and the heritage that we come from. And thirdly, how we differentiate. 
So our culture, our, our generational businesses, our heritage, the way we produce and how we do things differently, these are all credentials that support the provenance agenda and they are all unique. Um, different countries have different unique factors, but in Scotland we think we're very unique. Next slide, slide please, Callum. So the key question is, why is provenance important? And why is it important to Scotland? Um, so firstly, I think there's three broad areas. Firstly, consumer demand. We know there's enormous consumer interest and growing consumer interest on things like where the food comes from and how that food is produced. It's not just about the quality anymore and the taste. It's much broader than that. So when you look at international markets, we know that in Japan, for example, they're very focused on the environmental aspects. We know in China it's about food safety. We know in the USA it's much more about the heritage of the food. So we know these are important attributes for our food. Um, the poll on the left hand side that you can see here was a, a recent survey of UK consumers um, measuring the importance of local produce and the provenance that goes around that. And you can see yourself that the figures are extremely high for many of our products. They are red meat being the highest, 74% of those polled deemed that the that local produce and the provenance that go around that were very important. You've got vegetables, you've got salmon, soft fruit, poultry, dairy, all extremely high. So that shows you there's consumer demand out there for our story and our provenance credentials. So that's the first thing, there's clearly consumer demand. Second aspect is around the premium. We know it differs in different markets, but we know there's a premium price attracted for our brand, whether that is maybe brands like Scotch beef, whiskey, or where we have European designation around our protected food names. These attributes of quality give us a premium in the market and it will differ in different markets, but that is really important to get that margin back to our producers. And thirdly, as around our competitors, we need to keep pace with our competitors in a global market and we need to keep ahead where we can. There's just images on the screen there about Ireland and New Zealand. Both of those countries do provenance extremely well and they have a really strong and authentic story to back out, back up their credentials. We need to keep pace with that and we need to go beyond that. So that's why it's important, that's why provenance is important. Final slide please, Carl. So what we're going to do in this space, um, as part of the recovery plan, we want to scope out and do some work around how we strengthen our brand and strengthen, what, and strengthen the characteristics that support that brand. We have quite a good story just now in Scotland. We tell a good story, but it could be better. It could be more coherent, it could be more powerful, and it could be supported by better evidence for Scotland PLC. There's no doubt that some sectors have a strong brand story, but we think we can make it more powerful. So we're going to explore how we do that collectively uh, going forward. We know there's many things that we've got going for us. Our clean water, our land, our climate, our craft, our husbandry, our family stories. That is all great stuff but we need to do better to bring it to life. We need to have a bit more coherence to bring it to life, and we need to be able to marshal and convey that to our customers, buyers, whatever it might be around the world. But we need to go further. And can, the challenge today, I think, is can science help us go further with those attributes? How can we stand out even more from those attributes that other countries have? Because people like Ireland and New Zealand also have these things that I've listed here. So how do we tell that story better than them? But how can we go further? How can science help us go further so we can remain at the forefront um, in consumers' minds and buyers' minds and porters' minds so Scotland continues to stand out in the crowd in what is a very, very busy marketplace going forward? So I'm going to leave it there in the time I have available um, and happy to pick up any conversation later. Thanks, John. That's absolutely fantastic. And, and that's a great challenge um, that I think can be addressed by many of the speakers today. I'm going to quickly pass to Neil Freckingham from the Seed Pod. Neil. Good afternoon. Um, if I could have my one and only slide, please. Right. <clears throat> this afternoon, I just wanted to give you an update on what Seed Pod is all about. So, really, the reason. Uh, I'm here speaking is it's a 21 million pound project. 10 million is coming from the city region deal for Aberdeen. We've got funding coming from Opportunity Northeast, and we're going to be located on the SRUC site at Crabston. So this is going to be a physical building. It's a representation of our um, current planning it is in front of you just now. And this building will be open summer 22. 
It will be filled with resources of people, skills uh, in food technology, development chefs, and every other type of skill you need to get your business up and running and growing. In addition to this, it will be um, incubator space, pilot space, but most importantly, we will have enough equipment in there to develop the products. It's a national asset. That's the thing I really want to stress. This is a national asset for food and drink innovation and commercialization. This is for us all. This isn't just for the Northeast. So really, in a bit more detail, what does it have? Well, people and skills, whether it's training, knowledge, whether it's food technologists, whether it's legal, whether it's business growth, these skills will be available for you to come and interact with. We'll have plant and equipment available and be a place to meet and a place to work. We'll have collaboration space, desk space, hot desk space. So the incubators where we want to grow our businesses, these will be food grade, thousand square foot, highly serviced and flexible. That is one of the key parts here. We're not making them specialist. That is what the companies will be doing. The NPD kitchen will really be the beating heart of this building, taking your concepts up to a commercial sample, helping you scale up from pilot uh, and changing and um, adapting your recipes with novel proteins and novel ingredients. Demonstration kitchen is really the place to wow your customer and your buyer. You'll bring people here to show and tell how your product works. I've mentioned the pilot plant. Again, a very highly flexible space where they expect to see equipment manufacturers come up and show what they can do. But equally, some of our larger companies may want a safe space to go and work and trial equipment. And coupled with all this will be event space, collaboration areas, meeting rooms and desks where all our specialists can meet and work together. So examples of that in incubators, we've got a lot of uh, young companies starting up, I'm not surprisingly through this pandemic, but before. So these are people that are probably working in a kitchen right today, trying to get themselves launched. They've got an issue with getting accreditation. They've got an issue with volumes. They've got an issue with space. So in Seedpod, they'll be able to rent one of 12 uh, incubator units, about a thousand square foot, highly serviced, food grade ready, and you can then get the keys and you'll work on your own product in there. But you'll be supported by the team. We've got shared logistics areas, shared cold storage, shared freezer storage, ambient storage. We'll have a specialist there to help you make it work. The MPD kitchen exists for all companies of any size who want to come and work with their own specialists or with ours. As I said, take these concepts and work them up to scale. I think the demonstration kitchen is something that's really come to life over this pandemic where social media and the use of webinars and such like is so important now to connect to others. And that use of being able to video your food, photograph your food, or as I really alluded at the start, was bring the buyers, bring the consumers up and show and tell, and really is a wow factor. And this is something a lot of our companies do not have. So rather than investing in themselves, come and use the one at Seedpod. So really a call to action for the people on this really is get involved. We are really um, following ahead, planning permission early next year, spades in the ground July next year, and as I said, opening up a year after that. So we're really on a roll now, and I'm keen to get feedback as we get through into our different stages of design. Um, we've got a lot more to share with the industry, and that is a chance to come and shape it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Neil. That's fantastic. And let's start to think about how we, we use the centre to build our provenance. I'm going to hand over now to Annetta, um, who's going to talk about, uh, well, entitled Sea Forward with SRUC and about our fish research. Thanks, Annette. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about some research towards provenance that we're doing related to aquaculture industry in Scotland. Uh, my name is Annette Boerlage and I'm an aquatic epidemiologist, uh, which means that I study population health of aquatic species. If we think of aquaculture, we may think of net pens in the sea, but aquaculture is much more. It's also uh, culture in freshwater lochs, ponds, and hatcheries. Uh, the species we culture in Scotland are uh, seaweeds and shellfish, uh, which you see on the slide here. So we culture uh, mainly mussels, but also oysters and scallops. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but of course, our most uh, famous aquaculture product here is the salmon. But we do also culture other uh, finfish, such as trout, halibuts, and cleaner fish. 
And cleaner fish are fish that we cohabit with the salmon uh, to nibble or eat uh, sea lice off the salmon. So it's a biological treatment really. And these fish have to be cultured separately when they are young. And next slide. So a little bit about the salmon. It's the UK's largest food export product. Uh, it contributes about 885 million to the wider Scottish economy. And this was a figure from last year. Uh, most export is to France, uh, where Scottish salmon was the first fish and the first non-French product to be awarded the prestigious Label Rouge Quality Mark certification. And uh, we're hoping that will all be good after Brexit, uh, but we'll sure find a way to uh, keep going with that. Uh, next slide, please. Within the European Union, uh, salmon is also the largest aquaculture product in value. And most salmon within the European Union comes from Scotland, a little bit from Ireland, uh, which means also that this pie chart will change after Brexit. Uh, Scottish salmon is recognized around the world for premium quality, taste and health benefits. And uh, Scottish salmon producers are working very hard to keep their good names. Uh, next slide. So, Earlier this year, um, there was this news article where a high-end Scottish salmon producer took measures in their own hands to protect, protect its products by using forensic science to tackle illegal food fraud. They went into restaurants and uh, asked for parts of the salmon to uh, find out if it was really their salmon. Uh, next slide. Next to providing revenue and being delicious, uh, salmon production is also very efficient. It has the potential to feed more people with fewer resources than required for other protein sources. This is important because with an expanding human population, we need to invest in efficient ways to feed us. Um, there are some examples here on this slide. On the left top, uh, you see that we need a few tons of feed to produce salmon compared to other protein sources. Uh, there's a lot of edible meat on the salmon. In the left bottom, you see that the carbon footprint is uh, quite good. There is a little water consumption. If you compare the production, uh, the production of salmon compared to other protein sources is lower. But worldwide, aquaculture is still an increasing uh, industry. We call it the blue e uh, revolution uh, because uh, aquaculture is so efficient. Uh, it is still uh, increasing in lots of areas. Next slide, please. In Scotland, sustainability is high on the agenda. Um, this is a report from the Scottish Salmon Producers Organization that came out earlier this month. It's a sustainability charter in which they set out how to develop towards zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045 and deal with the post-COVID recovery. And they talk about things like animal welfare, the environment and traceability and also provenance. Um, at SRUC, uh, these are all topics that we are very familiar with and that we work with. Uh, next slide. So uh, different things we do uh, with aquaculture. Um, I've listed here, uh, they're quite variable. So we do consultancy and that uh, from our unit, our EPI unit, that could be any data or EPI work that is required and usually involves projects with a quick turnover or that have a commercial interest. Uh, and for that commercially interested, there is no publication possible. We also do teaching. Uh, for example, we have data management and descriptive statistic courses that we run with aquaculture and we use a lot of aquaculture examples uh, to help them better understand what they can achieve with their own data. Um, I have a few examples of some larger products here and I projects and I thought I'd talk a little bit about sea lice cost effectiveness and uh, the gill health projects. Next slide please. So this might be a little small for you. Um, this is an example of the sea lice cost effectiveness project uh, that's just finished. In red, you see different treatment methods and in the left corner you see our cleaner fish that we talked about before. So this is a very complex problem and we tackled this from a lot of different angles. Uh, we use social sciences, economics, life cycle assessments and epidemiology to really look at different angles uh, at this problem. Uh, at this problem. 
and this uh, has been uh, published at the government, uh, Scottish government website. So you can find some more details about the project there if you want to. Um, I also wanted to point out the Gill Health project. Um, Gill Health is an emerging disease and it's almost as important as sea lice and together I would say they are the most important disease problems uh, that aqu salmon aquaculture has at the moment. Um, we're still in the middle of this project, but we're finding that most likely a major part of the cases are primarily due to jellyfish and phytoplankton blooms. And this is a problem because these are getting more abundant, uh, most likely due to climate change and ocean warming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yep, yeah, this one. Um, so sometimes when I'm out sampling, I think, oh, ocean warming would be great because it can be quite cold. But of course, uh, ocean warming is quite bad for the fish, as we see in this Gill, Gill Health project. And we hope uh, through this project, we'll be able to make some recommendations and for mitigation measures and better sampling protocols to uh, tackle this problem. Next slide. And next slide. One more? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, thanks, Callum. So in the great clouds of the future, we see that stakeholder engagement is very important in our projects and not only including the industry, but also the hill walkers and the people at the Tesco buying the meat. So the entire value chain. And we have on the one side, the blue revolution, agriculture is increasing. And on the other side, we have the green economy. And that doesn't have to be on different sites. We need to merge them into the one site to develop more sustainably and we think in our research uh, we can help with that. I've called it here turquoise research based on the color so I don't think this is an official buzzword yet but in our view this means multidisciplinary and applied research so that it's timely useful and applicable and I think SRUC's expertise is very much in line uh, with sustainable development and a better product will lead to better provenance so I think we can definitely help with that and I look forward to see what the future collaborations will bring. Thank you very much, Kerry. Thank you, Anessa. That was really interesting. I'm going to quickly pass on to Vicky, please. And um, Vicky Sanderlands is going to talk about the provenance of poultry post Brexit. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for coming along. So I just wanted to start off um, really kind of uh, touching on what John mentioned about different, what does provenance mean? And I want to tell you a little bit about the history of poultry in Scotland. Um, now, I realized on reflection that I don't mean by my first bullet point that chicken only arrived in Scotland in 1956. But really, it was the uh, post-war era where um, food rationing uh, was taking place that the separation of poultry into eggs and meat started to happen. And most significantly for Scotland, um, in 1956, Chunky Chicks was established, um, which is part of Nichols, and uh, that was established in Midlothian. And that company has since become Aviagen, which is now one of the biggest breeders of meat chickens, which are broilers uh, in the world. Um, their nearest competitor is a company called Cobb Van Tress, which started in the United States. And Aviagen are now responsible for these uh, three brands, Arbor Acres, Ross, and Rowan Range. And so probably uh, a lot of the chicken you eat from the supermarkets are Ross broilers. And just a little interesting uh, bit of history for you. I, I didn't know this until recently. Did you know that American fried chicken apparently has origins in Scotland? So we can take a lot of credit, whether you want it or not, for Kentucky fried chicken, perhaps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, egg production is also of significance to Scotland. Um, there are three major egg production companies and many other smaller companies uh, based in Scotland, or, or at least that have franchises in Scotland. And Scotland produces about 13 to 14% of the UK's eggs. Next slide, please. So how does SRUC research uh, in poultry support the sector's provenance? Um, we've had many projects um, that have either finished or ongoing at the moment. 
that help to support the provenance of poultry industry. So we've done things like developing whole house culling methods for poultry disease outbreaks, which is important in these times in particular where we have avian influenza. Um, we're working on developing a vaccine for red mites with the Morden. We uh, continue to look at the ontogeny and control of Compilobacter outbreaks in broilers, which is a, a con considerable loss of revenue for the broiler industry. Uh, we've looked at things like the importance of aerial perches for laying hen welfare, and that has fed into the Scottish guidance document that goes out to all laying hen producers. And we're looking at how to manage hens without the need to beak trim, which you'll see shortly um, still has importance in our work today. Next slide, please. SRUC has a, an important role to play in the provenance of the sector because the poultry companies are always looking for well-qualified people. And it's probably the most common question I get from poultry producers that I meet. Where can we get people that are well-qualified? But SRUC runs two particularly distinct poultry courses. They do one uh, at HNC level in poultry production. And we also have an MSc in applied poultry science. And the people that come on those courses include people such such as poultry veterinarians that want to get further information uh, on poultry specific subjects because they don't get a lot of that in vet school, but also feed company employees and poultry farm managers and so on. Next slide, please. So when it comes to post-Brexit, what are the key issues for the poultry sector? Um, these don't just affect Scotland, I should say. These are um, UK-wide issues, I think. And one of those post-Brexit issues is that we maintain standards as per the relevant EU directives, both without gold plating, so without making our standards higher and thus increasing the cost for producers, which would make their products non-competitive, but also without lowering our standards so that we can still trade within the EU, but also not allowing cheaper or poor welfare imports into the country. So this is a really key issue around competition with this point. Another key issue post-Brexit is we will be dealing with annual avian influenza outbreaks for the foreseeable future, and that comes at a significant cost to the industry because uh, an outbreak of AI results in depopulation of the flocks, and uh, cleansing and disinfection, which is considerably expensive. So that is going to be a continuous problem. And the other key Brexit issue, post-Brexit issue, is that the UK industry is uh, moving towards ending beak trimming in laying hens. Uh, beak trimming is commonly used as a method of controlling the damage caused by feather pecking. Uh, and it can cause mortality in flocks. But there's a well, real welfare drive that we stop that practice of beak trimming routinely. And the industry is working with researchers like ourselves to try and do that on a, on a voluntary basis by looking at ways to uh, prevent the behavior from happening. And the other thing that is going to be likely to stop in the near future is the use of enriched cages for laying hen egg production. Uh, enriched cages are permitted under EU regulations, but the, uh, the major supermarkets um, have voluntarily opted to stop stocking uh, enriched cage eggs from 2025. So producers need to be looking to what other system they can move into to still produce a quality but less expensive egg than the free range eggs. And I think those are the key issues. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Vicky. Really interesting stuff. And I'm going to move quickly on. We've got some good questions coming in, so people could remember to ask questions as we go along in the chat function. I'd like to introduce Sarah Miller, who is the Director of External Affairs at Quality Meat Scotland. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, if you've been speaking to me on Monday or even yesterday, I didn't actually have a voice, so I feel like I'm doing significantly better than I was expecting to. So this afternoon, I just want to give you an overview of how we work across the red meat supply chain to ensure that we have the data and actions that underpin the integrity of our brands, Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, and especially selected pork. Next slide, please, Callum. So who is QMS? Um, for those of you, most of you will know, some of you may not, we are a non-departmental public body. So we are funded by levy collected um, on livestock processed in Scotland. We have a four-pillared strategy to support, develop, 
promote and protect the red meat industry in Scotland. And that protection piece has become much more important in the last few years, as we've seen um, some emerging consumer trends and some emerging mistruths um, coming throughout the globe. Um, next slide, please, Callum. And in Scotland, that red meat industry has some quite specific characteristics that, that we enjoy. So we were some of the first in the world to introduce whole of life, whole of supply chain quality assurance. And that this year is over 30 years old. So th this, this was something at the time was quite groundbreaking and something quite special that we've been able to develop and are able to promote to our consumers around the world. The Scotch PGI brands are respected across the world and Scotch and Scotch beef price that is the one area that attracts a premium. So today um, in Scotland, Scottish farmers will receive around a sixpence premium over the northern abattoirs because of that quality assurance. So that's helping drive additional revenue into the into the sector by having that provenance and by having that brand story that we can sell. Okay. Next slide, please, Callum. So the four, we've got four different campaigns up here, and these are some of the marketing activities that, that you guys will be more familiar with. This is sort of the public face of what QMS does is. Our marketing campaigns are designed really to link our producers and their stories in the field with what our consumers are looking for. So some of the key factors are hard for us are having those recognisable brand marks, whether it be the Scotch beef, the PGI logo, the specially selected pork logo or the Scotch lamb logo. Um, and combining that with some of our regular in-depth consumer insight work to, to essentially tell us what people are looking for from the product. So on the Scotch beef campaign we ran in early 2019, Know Your Beef. That was really a call to action for people to, to understand where the beef was coming from and what was behind that, because we know that behind that Scotch beef label, we can demonstrate the required integrity um, and actions within the supply chain that back up that high provenance brand. And all, all this work is really based on a regular in-depth consumer insight work that our marketing team do. And that really gives us integrity that, that we have from that well-evidenced farm assurance chain. Um, next slide, please, Callum. One of the key challenges, um, or it's not, not always a challenge, it's a, it's a challenge and an opportunity that we have as a non-departmental public body, is because we are aligned to Scottish Government, everything we do has to be 100% factual, 100% correct. So when we're going through and developing a marketing campaign, Everything that we do and say has to be um, has to go through the Advertising Standards Authority. Um, and again, if we go on television after that, it has to be um, approved by Clearcast as well. So unlike some other organisations, we won't put out you know spurious claims. If 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 we say something that is that is aligned to the Scotch brand, it is one hundred percent bulletproof. And that, that means two things. It means, one, that when we are undergoing an advertising campaign, consumers can trust us, and we have built up a, a long history of trust with consumers. But it also means sometimes that, that we have to be a bit more cautious of what we can say. We have to make sure that the data and the evidence behind what we're saying is absolutely there. And particularly around the area of sustainability, where we know that the data isn't well enough established for our Scottish farmers yet, we cannot come out and say um, sometimes what, what our farmers and what our producers would like us to say. We, we need to make sure that it is 100% um, well evidenced. Um, next slide, please, Callum. One of the things, um, I suppose, is, again, as an NDPB, is we are the red meat industry conduit. You know, we're pulling together supply chain from field to fork and then focusing them on that market inside work, inside work. That consumers are looking for and then we use that to develop our standards so between everything that we do we have our quality assurance standards we have our marketing campaigns and each feed off each other you, you can't have a marketing campaign without the standards behind that and to do that we need to involve the whole of industry to help make sure that the standards that we have are suitable for the whole industry and that, that give that rigor that they're aligned with 
um, regulation, that they, they're forward looking and actually deliver what consumers are looking for. And that, again, gives us that ability to sell that trust to consumers. You know, someone says, how, how can you prove um, that, that the Scotch pork brand is a high welfare pork brand? Well, you know, we, we have claims that we can back that up. We'll come on to that in a second. Um, next slide, please, Callum. Being able to sell and cascade those messages out to consumers so that they understand clearly what, what we are looking to do and align with our values is something that's, again, is quite important to us. And an example of that is what I mentioned earlier with our specially selected pork brand. Um, we have a commitment with the SSPCA where they visit every pork farm in Scotland, pig farm in Scotland. And that's also part of our beef and sheep scheme farm assurance. So. There's an example here of how working in partnership with different areas of industry can help bring benefits that consumers trust and that gives us something that we can we can sell our credentials on. And that's something it's, it's almost a unique partnership in the world, and one that we're very, very proud of. It's been going on for 20 years now. Um, so working with partners to help enhance our offering and, and build that through the offering that we're making within the brands is incredibly important. Next slide, please, Callum. I mean, the way that we've engaged with consumers has in, changed quite rapidly in the last few years. Um, the, the ascent of online and social media has given a highway to post-truth and mistruths, which travel very quickly around the internet. So whilst we, we need to make sure that we have confidence in our proactive marketing that it is accurate, we also need to have confidence that our credentials are watertight at farm level as well. And that we can rely on that 365 days of the year so that retailers trust us that consumers trust retailers so everything we do is working in partnership with different parts of the supply chain to make sure that we can all build on each other's work um, and enhance that and turn that into a tangible consumer offering next slide please callum which takes us on to standards development as i said we have a whole of life, whole of supply chain farm assurance across all three species, um, beef, lamb and pork. And each scheme here is reviewed every two years. And each scheme has an industry committee behind it feeding into the standards development. So it's quite a rigorous process. You know, we don't just pluck out, out of thin air what people are looking for. There, there's a methodology and a, and a strategy behind this. Um, so that because we're operating at industry scale and not just at a producer group, we have to make sure everything we do has been tested, not just for what works in the central belt of Scotland, but it's equally as, as applicable to a farm in the US or a farm in Dumfries and Galloway. So just as an example of, of the type of thing that, that would be reviewed through our standards, last year in 2019, we reviewed our cattle and sheep standards for our cattle and sheep farms where we brought in the pilot for spot checks, which means that 365 days in the year, an assessor could go out onto a beef or sheep farm and, and make sure that they are adhering to the QMS standards, which is something that um, had to be well tested with industry because, you know, working livestock farms, it's, there has to be a respect there. Um, but again, that gives something there for consumers and retailers to buy into. Next slide, please, Callum. So just moving into some of you know how are QMS looking to the future and what some of the future of provenance and traceability might bring. One of the one of the areas that we've been looking at for a few years now is this idea around DNA traceability. And it was quite interesting listening to the salmon um, fish, fish fin fish talk earlier, um, and that's something that they're also looking at. So this has already been brought in by some really retailers in the last few years on the back of the horse meat scandal as a way of them building trust in their relationship. It's something that we've recognised that is that DNA, while it also offers a traceability element, there is a huge, huge potential um, for to enhance the performance of the Scottish beef herd as well. Um, so we've been looking at how we could develop a whole industry DNA traceability project, and that's 100% funded by Scottish government, um, and it's in pilot stage just now. Next slide, please, Callum. So what we want to do with that programme is to really increase trust in the Scotch brand, but also tackle this, this twin problem of environmental and economic sustainability. So there's, there's three 
three major outcomes for that there. Um, so what we've came up with is a maternal DNA project, which we believe offers that productivity improvement with a low error rate. So you, you get the traceability piece, but you also um, get this data set, this whole industry data set that you could then use to increase economic and environmental sustainability of Scottish beef production. Next slide, please, Callum. So some of the information on this slide here came from the, the desk-based um, report that we did to that basically kick-started this piece of work. Um, so you're looking at you know, a 350% return on investment there over a 10-year period. Um, but as with all desk-based reports, we, we needed to test this in the field. We needed to know whether the methodology um, that, came, that, that was brought to us would actually work. Um, so there's a project going on just now that will report in early January to, to test whether that has essentially whether it's worked. But the beauty in this is the simplicity of it all. At farm level, all we are asking for is one sample of DNA to be taken from the breeding females with Scottish beef herd. So it's not requiring every single um, animal to be tested, it's just requiring the female to be tested. The traceability piece is linked into our quality assurance standards. So if you remember, um, the criteria for Scotch is that it's got to be born, reared and slaughtered in Scotland. So if you take a DNA sample from a steak from Tesco's that's labelled under the Scotch beef brand, you should be able to correlate that back to the breeding female and the farm that that steak came from. Um, so it's, it's quite simple in how, how it works, but the, the range of data that you get on the back of that is, is quite amazing. So as I said, there'll be more information on that project come January when the final report is out. It's one that we have managed to keep going despite COVID, um, which has been quite some feat. Next slide, please, Callum. So that's just a sort of quick run through in, in terms of how, how we work at QMS and how we manage that field to fork journey from producer right through to the supply chain and what we're doing now and also some of the things we're looking at in the future. Um, you know, we have a world-class quality assurance offering. We, we work with robust evidence-based industry knowledge. We're quite lucky in the amount of data that we, we manage and we work with. Um, and there's a huge amount of partnership working that goes on to make sure that we can keep building and keep moving the Scotch brands further forward um, with that integrity base behind it. Um, so hopefully I haven't gone over time there, Kerry. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Fascinating. Some really interesting points coming out of there that I'm sure there'll be lots to build on in the discussion. I'm going to hand now over to um, Dorota Jarrett, who um, works for the James Hutton uh, Limited, and she's going to talk about uh, our fruit research and breeding and how that supports provenance. Thank you, Dorota. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dorota Jarrett. I'm a fruit breeder at the James Hutton Limited, and today I'm going to speak about the relevance of fruit research and breeding in supporting food provenance. So in a way of very short introduction, James Hutton Institute is a multidisciplinary institute delivering fundamental and applied science to drive sustainable use of land and natural resources. And James Hutton Limited draws on this fundamental science and work alongside other collaborators, growers and consumers to align the product of plant breeding that is in the heart of, of our uh, activities with producers and consumers and the needs of the industry. So at the moment, we have several active breeding programs. Those are around development of improved varieties of blackcurrant, raspberry and blackberry. They're all developed on heritage, Scottish heritage, and we proudly name them after Scottish bens, glens and lochs. And recently we have added more fruit to our, our portfolio, responding to the needs of the industry. And those are red currant and blueberry. Next slide, please. So berry market is worth 1.5 billion in the UK and 115 million in Scotland. UK is one of the biggest markets for berry sales and we rely on a lot of imports. So about 50% of our needs are imported and the sales are growing 10% year on year. So there is some kind of competition there that an opportunity for us to increase the national production. 
We know about the raising stars such as blueberry, of which production grew tenfold in recent years because it provides very nice snackable fruit that everybody loves. So with our new current uh, blueberry breeding program, we have estimated that new successful variety will contribute 90 million per year to the economy. And regularly we ask our consumers what do they value in fruit and in healthy food and drink products. And although provenance doesn't come first, it, it is recognized. The first attributes that people are interested in are test quality, taste quality and price. And it's not said that, that provenance doesn't equal to, to the quality and to the taste. Next one, please. So fruit crops, just like any other crops, are at the mercy of the environment and the change in climate is really affecting us. So it's absolutely fundamental that we continue important uh, research into the climate resilience and adaptation of our crops. We also need to make them more robust and develop varieties that are more pest and disease resistant, as well as increase the sustainable yield to, to make it more economical to, draw, to grow our crops. So agronomic resilience is very important here. Alongside comes the quality and this is really what drives the purchase as you could see. So things like appearance, color, flavor and nutritional value are all the traits that we study and develop and, under, and try to understand using uh, technologies such as crop imaging, uh, genetic mapping and genetic marker development. That then helps us to provide the tools and knowledge for the breeding programs to make them more precise uh, and make the whole process much faster because breeding is such a long process. Alongside we also develop skills and skills are very important to us and I think we should continue to do so. Um, together with funding for the research, we also make sure we maintain bank, gene bank collections of high health stock. This is the fundament of, of our industry. Um, it would be very damaging to start from virus plants and so on. And there is clear benefit from all of that. It is shown that by investing one pound in science, we can see 12.75 pounds in economic return. Next. Side slide, please. And the proof is in the pudding. We can see, we could see the first crop of climate resilient blackcurrants this year developed for Santori Rabina. The, the winters are getting warmer, and this variety that is very adaptable gives some kind of respite to growers and they can rely on it. So we need more varieties like this that also have fantastic quality that is suitable for making Rabina. We have also developed a raspberry variety that is disease resistant, uh, resistant to Phytophthora root rot, which is very damaging um, disease in the industry. At one point almost put a stop to growing uh, raspberries in Scotland. We have also done a study uh, tasting uh, several selections of our breeding program um, blueberries uh, and benchmark them uh, to shop bought blueberries from imports this year and we could see that on average those were 30 percent uh, had 30 percent increased liking which gives us confidence that we are doing something right and we should continue doing so uh, next slide please thank you um, so with the funding from Tay City Deals, we are going to step up our science and develop global hub for precision agriculture here at Dundee site that will be called Advanced Plant Growth Center. This will be a good platform for increased research capacity for people to collaborate together for the stakeholders and actually international capital to come here and do more research that we all can benefit from. So we are very excited for that and this will really deliver increased commercial and economic environmental benefits uh, for the UK and wider economy. So we will be inviting all of you to come and work with us there. So research supports development of tools and services assisting industry to protect food quality, integrity, safety and prevent potential fraud. 
And we use two of those tools regularly. Those are based around authenticity and using genetic markers and provenance using isotope stable uh, stable isotope ratios. And next one, please, Callum. So we use genetic markers for breeding programs to be able to differentiate between the plants that have resistance to several pests and diseases, but also assist propagators that propagate plants in millions each year to help them validate that variety A that they're trying to produce is true to type, which is very, extremely important. We also, um, this also allows us to police the plant variety rights licensing um, obligations from, from, from growers and other producers. And isotope ratio uh, is very useful in determining provenance of the food. By looking at strontium isotopes, for example, we can discriminate the source of raspberries. Um, next one, Callum. Uh, differentiate between different production system. Uh, so nitrogen isotopes help us uh, to show enrichment uh, when grown organically or conventionally. Lots of people uh, want to support certain ethics and environment, uh, and, and it will be important for them uh, for quality assurance in those type of products. Next one, please, Callum. And also, for example, additional addition of the cane sugar to fruit juice will alter the carbon isotope signature. So we can also safeguard the quality of, of several processed products as well. And the next one, please. So just to summarize and then describe four key steps to success within the fruit industry, the research and breeding are absolutely fundamental. They enable the industry and provide and secure future crops, develop skills, tools, and knowledge, um, collaboration, and provide improved varieties. Those then go to growers and producers and brand, providing resilient uh, crops of improved quality and yield. We also help to reduce picking costs by providing larger fruit, uh, higher yields. We know how growers struggle recently with uh, labor shortage. So this is very important to support them here. We also provide the evidence of nutritional value of crops and perhaps all those innovation opportunities will help us to develop market and brands for export because export of fruit products is not very significant at the moment, but it's one of the aims of the food and drink industry. This then goes to ret retailers. They also get opportunity for innovation, having improved products that was made close to closer to the source with increased quality and improved shelf life. We provide them premium quality um, and hopefully economic benefit. Um, and we all work towards the happy customer. Um, we want to give them improved flavor, but we also want to educate them uh, and increase the knowledge about fruit provenance um, because they support the economy and help sustainable growth and indirectly support research and development. Um, we also need to remember about the ch other challenges such as uh, food poverty and obesity. And the next one, please. So yeah, thank you for giving me the floor today. I hope I demonstrated that the science can influence the market. We should collaborate and support each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorota. Fascinating and some really interested and key messages there. Moving quickly on to Robin Walker, a colleague of ours, who's going to talk about his Scottish organic canola project. So over to you. Thank you, Robin. Hi, thank you. Um, so yes, basically we've done quite a lot of research uh, on organic systems uh, at SRUC, um, based at Crabeston primarily. Um, and this particular project was about growing oilseed rape or canola as it's known in, in um, Canada. Um, but really, key thing here is oilseed rape isn't really grown organically in the UK, let alone Scotland. 
but one of the drivers behind this particular project was Norvi, which is one of the local uh, feed companies based out near Old Meldrum who have got a crusher um, and they were really keen to procure, procure organic oilseed rape, um, particularly linked to the oil um, to help some of their customers, particularly um, with chickens, uh, egg laying hens. So um, we've heard about some of the poultry work going on elsewhere. Um, so a company called Highland Eggs that were desperately keen to get oilseed rape. The other thing is there's um, changes to the organic uh, regulations in terms of having to provide or get uh, more regional um, production or get your, your feed um, more locally produced. So the other thing obviously if you're crushing um, or cold pressing your oilseed rape is you end up with oil but you also end up with a meal which is a high protein source which can be used for a range of other livestock uh, purposes. So the idea behind this was they were really keen on the oil, really keen on the meal, um, for feed purposes for livestock but also primarily for the oil in terms of uh, food use. So there were a number of um, initiatives went on, there was lots of chat went on for a while um, and there was a risk group so a rural innovation support service group was set up in about 2018 and through a chance um, discussion that I had with uh, Swedish colleagues um, Basically, they said, yeah, we grow quite a lot of oilseed rape in, in Sweden and it probably would be possible to grow it in uh, Scotland. So could I have the next slide, please, Callum? So why Sweden? Well, you can see on the little map uh, on the right hand side, I've kind of starred us um, in Scotland and a place called Linkoping in Sweden is pretty much on the same latitude to us. Uh, soils are similar to some extent. But in Sweden, they do grow a lot. 10,000 hectares out of a total crop of about 110,000 hectares is grown organically. So 10% of their crop is organic oilseed rape. So they know what they're doing. So could I have the next slide, please? So after we'd had this trip to Sweden, um, we thought, yep, yeah, it's probably possible to grow in Scotland. Uh, and a few farmers decided to go ahead uh, in 2019, 2020. So there were a couple have tried growing the spring uh, oilseed rape um, immediately after the trip uh, and one of them also grew some of that in 2020 as well and five farmers have now tried growing autumn oilseed rape um, at least once most of them are actually into the second cycle now because they've had one season of this um, and really it was a participatory research type project so um, it was really looking at a pilot study. So the technical input to these farms was through um, myself uh, as an SRUC researcher, but also uh, a guy called Andy Cheatham, who's a, an independent agronomist who also went on the trip to Sweden. So our knowledge was kind of being used uh, to help these farmers um, in terms of the information on the soils and, and basically underlying uh, agronomy, um, how to grow the crop, but also gathering data and collating this data so we got a better picture for what was needed. And underlying all of this um, was a, a Cative project uh, led by myself, which really helped facilitate uh, a lot of the group's knowledge exchange activities, not, not only within the group, but also uh, further afield as well. So we're kind of passing on that knowledge exchange. Next slide, please. So as I said, it was really a participatory research project. Um, and it was really a farmer led pilot studies. So three of the farms, three of the five farms, um, we had much more detail uh, that we were looking at. And really it was an adaptation of the Swedish approach we use as a basis and how we could maybe utilize that. Obviously all the farms were organic. So uh, in terms of provenance, they're using uh, or traceability, they're using organic certification and they had to go through that process. Um, we were looking at things like varieties, so autumn and spring varieties I've mentioned. Um, and in the top picture there, you can see along the top of the car bonnet, there's actually one of the farms had four different varieties that they were looking at. Well, one, one was a mix actually, the far right hand end. But if you look from left to right, you can basically see getting slightly less bushy as, uh, as you go along in terms of the plants. And that was really linked to um, a disease called light leaf spot. So the ones on the left hand side were more resistant to this disease and the ones on the right hand side were less resistant and that actually came out in the, um, the yield uh, that we're getting as well. Also interested in things like the crop nutrition, looking at macro elements, N, P and K, 
and micro elements as well, things like boron. Um, so we're looking at organically approved products that could be used, so things like um, the manures that were on the farms, these kind of things, but also uh, whether there are other products that could be utilised as well, particularly in terms of micro elements, so things like um, um, seaweed uh, extracts were utilised for, for some things and linked to some of our Scottish government research and an EU project we've got called Remix as well. There's a link there in terms of intercropping, which is basically growing more than one crop on the same piece of land. So in this case, it was all seed rape, but with clover as an understory to get nitrogen fixation because it re the crop does really require a lot of nitrogen. Um, so that was uh, one of the elements we were looking at. Also things like establishment um, on either ploughed ground or reduced uh, um, tillage. So the second picture down there is looking at a uh, system chameleon, uh, which one of the farmers actually bought off the back of the trip to Sweden. Um, so that was basically allowing precision seeding and latterly it's the same machine on the, the second from the bottom slide as well. Um, robot weeding as well, so we're interested in weeding of, of these, uh, these crops. Um, obviously we can't use herbicides under an organic system so using robotic weeding to um, um, to keep the uh, crop clean of weeds was, was quite important and also volunteer control was was a problem where we don't want the actual rape crop to become a problem uh, in future years. Varietal resistance I've talked about as I say based on the top slide there, um, some of the experimental products in terms of pest uh, um, issues and disease issues as well and then harvesting options. So the bottom right hand picture there is of a swather, well actually it's the combine that's combining a swathed uh, crop um, which is used to kind of desiccate the crop so it evens the maturity. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at on a, on a broader scale in these, these uh, pilot study farms. So can we move on to the next slide please? So in terms of the yield and marketing, all the, well, most of the farms were successful. There were a couple that struggled a bit for um, mostly weather reasons, actually. Um, but the, the ones that did uh, grow successfully, uh, the yield average was about two and a half tonnes per hectare. The best ones were just over three tonnes per hectare, which, given it was really the first attempt, was pretty good. In Sweden, they're managing just under four tonnes per hectare, so we were quite close to that. So we were pretty pleased with, as a first bash. Um, oil quality was 40 to 44%, so fairly standard for oilseed rape, which would normally be conventionally grown. The erucic acid levels is really quite important. Um, and again, this, the oil gets tested and, um, through um, the, the crusher, so Norvac get these, these tested. And that's really important for human nutrition to be able to have that less than 2% erucic acid. The admix is things like weeds and other bits and pieces that wants to be low, so again, that was quite good and then it's dry to maintain its integrity so it doesn't go um, rancid. And again, there's a difference there as well. If you can reach the required level for the human use, then you actually get roughly a 25% uh, premium or you can do. Um, the plant, well, you can see the seed there in, in somebody's hand, uh, the top picture there. Uh, Norvite have got this, this plant that they set up in 2015. Um, so that's got organic certification through SOPA um, and just, just about a year ago um, they got salsa accreditation as well so you can use it for, for human uh, use as well. Now they are in the process of brand development. Um, they had a few issues um, in, in terms of, uh, of things but they, they're basically moving it forward but what they are really keen to do is maintain this kind of Scottish provenance angle and the bottle there is a picture of um, a mocked up bottle that they wanted to use so they wanted to kind of go down the whiskey bottle type route um, because it's, it's you know it's, it's pretty iconic in terms of um, Scottish drinks um, whereas a lot of the cold pressed oilseed rape um, generally has quite straight um, neck uh, you know quite you recognize it if you saw it in a, in a supermarket for example it's quite standard looking um, shaped bottle so they're going down the route of a uh, the, the, the whiskey type bottle. Um, but they are also aware that there's um, competition in terms of Swedish oilseed rape on the UK market and also some U uh, Ukrainian brand as well. So that's why they really want to maintain the, um, the Scottish sort of locally produced uh, angle. And off the back of what some of the other people have said uh, on the previous talks as well, linking to like the food miles, the energy usage and, and, and all, all the good things that you get about Scotland. 
and I think the next slide is basically just my acknowledgements for everybody who was involved in, in the project. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robin. Now, in the interest of keeping us on track, I'm going to probably be everybody's worst enemy and say we're not going to take a break. If you need a break, you can do so quietly and uh, grab your own cup of coffee. I'd like to continue going on. We've just got a few more speakers before we open for discussion. So if it's OK with everybody, I'd like to um, move on and uh, invite Paul Mayfield, our one of my team, actually, a senior consultant with an SAC Consulting, to talk about digital technologies and provenance. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just want to, to, a bit like Robin, run through a, a, a project that we did, um, finished uh, early this year and that we hope to, to, to continue. Um, this came about through uh, a, an inquiry, actually, from a group of, of uh, growers of gluten-free oats in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, and they were planning to put up their own processing facility, which they have done now, um, and market their own their own gluten-free oats. Um, as many of you will know, uh, oats are naturally gluten-free, so this is very much about um, contamination. So it's it's um, keeping uh, the the crop free from contamination on the farm is what they were interested in, so that they could. Uh, um, market it to to the industry as uh, specifically gluten free uh, there is no gluten free facility within scotland um, a processing facility uh, dedicated to gluten free they they have to go through the standard mills which have to be purged before they can um, a bit like some organic products purged out before they uh, uh, process the gluten free so um, they said is there any way that we can prove the provenance and the assurance really of our gluten-free oats uh, on the farm or from the farm through the rest of the supply chain. This is a, a stage where uh, I was getting interested in, in the application of blockchain, um, which a number of you may have heard of if you haven't already been involved in it, um, which come from the financial sector. But uh, what, what's interesting in, the, in blockchain is actually less about the blockchain, which is the way in which the data is stored, and more about what it's stored on, which is this di distributed ledger technology. So it's the ledger on which the information is gathered that was uh, was the interesting part. Um, and it's the way in which it's stored and how it's it's gathered and, and, and put onto the, the, uh, the ledger, uh, it's time stamped. So it provides uh, and a sort of auditable trail, really, of information as it's put onto the ledger, uh, and and we we wanted to conduct a project to uh, to test this really on farm to see whether um, it might solve uh, help to solve their problem or their requirements. Next, please, Callum. Yep. So. Um, and we, like Robin, actually, we this started as a as a rural innovation support service project. We then applied for funding, which where we did some planning um, and a, and a bit of sort of. Uh, desk feasibility. Um, we then applied for KTIF funding, uh, which we were fortunate enough to win, and that gave us the opportunity to, to actually do a, a small pilot and test the concept in, in uh, sort of real life, if you like. Um, so SIUC, we teamed up with a with a tech business from Edinburgh called uh, Wallet Services. They've just changed their name, but uh, they're still in existence. Who have who had the the um, distributed ledger technology? Um, and uh, we worked together uh, with with the group of farms uh, in terms of gathering what information they already had. Um, uh, right from really field cultivation all the way through to storage uh, on the farm. What we were kind of um, want to do is try and provide something where um, they're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, the, the farms are pretty well teched up already. They keep a lot of digital records, including their, their field management systems, um, but they also have uh, uh, yield monitors and things like that on the combines, and they 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 monitor the diesel usage when they do cultivations, etc. So um, we we 
what didn't want to sort of come in and ask them to gather another set of data we wanted to take that data uh, put it onto the ledger uh, and be able to to provide a, a sort of traceability assurance type system to give uh, their crop uh, a sort of provenance tr provenance trail uh, so we we did this uh, actually manually uh, initially. So we took what what information they had, and that wasn't just the digital stuff. Uh, we also uh, included photographs, for example, because they they do photograph when they clean down their machinery um, uh, between, say, planting uh, planting pr conventional crops and and planting their gluten free oats. They clean down the the drills, the the trailers. Uh, same at harvest, the, the combines clean down, the trailers combat clean down, the storage is, is cleaned down uh, totally, and they they take photographs uh, of that, uh, and that will give the the image has its own timestamp, so uh, you can uh, um, again put it within the the timeline of, of the production of the crop itself. So we um, we we. It, Put the information onto the ledger, uh, and at the end, we we were then able to um, to actually uh, we created a, a small dummy website for for the one want of a better uh, description, uh, and we were able to allow uh, uh, sort of like a, a, a faux public access to to show the, the consumer the journey that the crop had been on that didn't mean that uh, that every um body could could see everything all the information we took specific bits of the information to just to show the the track the journey that the the crop had been on to a certain point um so can you uh, next slide please callum so the, the project that we've done really is only at the farm end at the moment. Uh, so we, we did, the, as I say, the field record. So that's planting through to harvest and then going into storage. The, the uh, farm, the group of farms themselves have, have just set up a, a, their own processing plant on one of the, the, the farms. Um, we were hoping to, to uh, do another project shortly. Um, to do two things really. One is to extend the, the information flow uh, onto the ledger or down the supply chain. And the other is to automate the process of gathering that information. So uh, the, uh, automate the transfer of digital information, if you like, from say the farm management uh, software onto the ledger um, to, to be able to do this automatically so that you're not having to input data twice. Um, as I say, the, the project we did was, was very much uh, a pilot just to prove the concept initially. But as you can see from, from uh, the diagram there, it, it, it's possible that information uh, can, can be shared across the chain. Um, the, the, the other advantage with distributed ledger is that you can give uh, nuanced privileges uh, to for people to access certain in, uh, types of information or bits of information. So um, it may be that the, the next stage in the chain, say the manufacturer wants to see, uh, I don't know what the what has been applied to the crop. So the, 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 with, with agreement, the farmers could actually give them permission to kind of see the spray records for the crop, for example. Um, and and then the consumer, as I say, could could uh, see the, the where it comes from, uh, how it's been processed, uh, the, the manufacturing processes, what other ingredients there are on it, um, uh, and and that could all be that's as much as they see. They don't have to. Not not everybody gets access to all information, so that there are a, a number of advantages of. Um, uh, of using this type of technology to provide provenance, um, and we we we're at this. Which are next slide, Callum, please. Yeah. So the the big advantages really of of DLT is that it's a single shared ledger between all the parties. So you're not having multiple copies of of the same ledger, which have to be updated on a regular basis. This is one. Uh, a ledger that sits uh, either in within one of the parties or in a third party potentially um, into which all the information is fed so that it's it's uh, the when anybody accesses it it's the latest set of information it's not uh, a, a, 
a different version of the same ledger. So um, that, that keeps it uh, up to date. Uh, it, as I said, it, you can, it gives, um, you can give uh, distinct permissions to different parties within the supply chain. So they're only really seeing the the information that they need to see or or it's agreed that they they can share um and that sort of helps i think to to build a, 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 a increased trust more trust than we actually see in many supply chains at the moment which i mentioned further down on the fifth bullet point um as it's, it's inclusive so all the supply chain partners can be involved. It's hoped that they would be involved because there are advantages to everybody. And I think that the retailers, as we hear, are, are becoming uh, more demanding uh, about uh, a, a requirement to provide providence and provenance and traceability information. Um, we, we want to try and automate the, the functions uh, as much as we possibly can. Uh, and I think this is this is feasible. We're we're hoping, as I say, that that we can um, at the next stage of the the supply chain. We, uh, sorry, the the project. We will uh, include sensors and IoT devices and sort of apps and APIs to to automatically gather the information. Uh, there can be a two-way flow of information. So um, we can. What we're hoping is that by putting um, QR codes perhaps onto the finished product that we can use that to get consumers uh, um, views on the product themselves, suggestions, anything like that, uh, so that it, it, that's also fed up the back up the chain. And it, it uh, provides, as it says, their traceability and provenance without actually having to kind of make all the information public. We did a, a small test which wasn't part really of the initial um, scope of the, the project that we did, but um, we did a small test to see whether it's feasible to allow a third party auditor to remotely uh, do an audit on the on the, uh, the, the chain or the, the, the information that's there with um and this was actually pre covid pre the uh, so we we were it was quite prescient really that we we proved that it is possible it would need a little bit of work still to to make that work but um uh, it would mean that you know uh, auditors wouldn't necessarily have to visit each of the premises it could could a lot of the work could actually be done remotely uh, by by providing access onto the ledger for them to see the the necessary paperwork and, and product flows etc uh, and then it may require a very fleeting visit to to kind of physically do that uh, check it up once every so often uh, and not perhaps as frequently as they they are at the moment so there, there's still quite a way to go but we we think that um, this has uh, a lot of legs and certainly is a is a really good tool to uh, to provide traceability and provenance in certain crops. It, it's, it's not the panacea that some people talk about with blockchain, but certainly as a tool for providing, as, as it says there, traceability and provenance. I think uh, it has a, a, a lot of mileage in it. So th there's a, there are a few is issues though within the, the industry. As we know, there's, there's often a, not a lot of trust within supply chains at the moment. So it actually, to make this, um, really work it it, it uh, needs to be well from where we've got it at the moment much more user friendly uh, it must integrate with the existing systems and it needs a much simpler interface or the the the, the sort of um, the way that it's seen on the screen needs to be simplified but that they're, they're sort of things that can be done uh, without too much trouble, that's a software thing. It needs cooperation of all the parties within a supply chain, uh, and that that's possibly what going to be one of the the, the biggest issues. Um, there's also requires trust. Uh, that's that's part of it, but we hope it could help build trust as well. Um, it, it does need a slight change of culture. Again, that comes to back this this trust and, and cooperation issue within part, supply chain parties. Um, and we think that to actually get uh, people you or the businesses using it, it must 
uh, add value in some way. Uh, that value may be just simply being able to comply with what the, the retailers demand in terms of provenance. But um, we're, we're hoping that, you know, uh, as we said earlier, that, that by providing um, provenance, we can actually add a small premium to the to the product itself as well um, because of the, the quality aspect, particularly of, of Scottish goods. So, uh, yeah, this is ongoing, but uh, we're getting there. Thank you. Uh, if, if anybody's any questions, then I'm quite happy to uh, either answer them now or, or you can um, take them later. Send them to oh, me later. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. We will take questions later and indeed after the event. Um, we've got Paul's um, contact details there. Um, thank you very much, Paul. That was excellent. Um, Robbie. Uh, Robbie's from James Hutton Institute and the University of Dundee, and he's going to speak to us about Scotch whisky and malting barley. Thank you, Robbie. So thanks, Terry, and thanks to um, all of you who are still hanging around towards the bitter end of this. So to put what I'm going to say into context, the Scotch whisky industry is worth annually around five and a half billion gross value added to the UK economy. It's the UK's largest food and drink export and overall one of the most profitable when you consider the origin of the raw materials and the fact that the whole product is homegrown. It's produced in more than 130 distilleries, often in rural communities, and provides more than 10,000 direct jobs in Scotland. With distilleries currently attracting more than two million visitors annually, the world of whisky is growing and it's expanding into new and productive areas. Next slide, please. Next. So while the story of whisky is well known, the raw material that fuels its success is both less well recognised or celebrated. So this is barley, the unsung hero. So barley wasn't always grown in Scotland. It originated in the Near East Fertile Crescent where it was domesticated around 12,000 years ago. As farming spread, so did the crops that ancient farmers grew. And after a 7,000 year journey, barley arrived in Scotland. As you can see here, barley is highly diverse. It comes in many different flavours that don't look at all like the barley growing today in farmers' fields. It was the process of selection and breeding that shaped barley into the form that we now grow today. So why barley? Well, just as it's morphologically diverse, it's also highly adaptive. It grows quickly and yields well on diverse, poor, and marginal lands, just like those common throughout Scotland. So today it's grown from the north of the Arctic Circle to the highlands of Ethiopia, the roof of the world in Tibet and southern continents, including Australia and Argentina. In Scotland, it's grown on around 300,000 hectares of land and yields around 2 million tonnes of grain annually. Around half of this is used by the whisky industry, who claim that around 90% of the barley that they use is Scottish grown. Next slide, please. So unlike most cereal grain commodities, the barley that's used for beer and whiskey is alive. It's germinated before use to break down the starch in the grain into fermentable sugars that can be turned into alcohol by yeast. So this process of controlled germination called malting in recent years has mainly been conducted on an industrial scale. However, several distilleries are now returning to malt their own locally sourced barley and explicitly market this fact on their products. Overall, Scotland produces around 800,000 tonnes of malted barley each year. But the very fact that malting barley is alive can make the consistent production of the highest quality malting barley tricky, to say the least. Next slide, please. So for example, um, high yielding, high starch barley cultivars can suffer defects that negatively impact their performance in malting and subsequently in the distillery. So grain skinning, shown here, is when the husk around the grain becomes loose and starts to flake off during harvest. A whole delivery of barley grain could be rejected at the malt house if grain skinning is severe, and what would have been a profitable crop for the farmer being downgraded to animal feed and sold at a price that may not even cover the costs of production. So growing malting barley is actually a risk for the farmer. In the International Barley Hub, which is another um, £35 million investment through the Tay Cities deal, we are identifying the underlying genetic risk factors that make certain barleys prone to skinning and other defects. We're identifying the genes that are responsible for this and studying how and why they cause the effects they cause. The practical outputs are genetic diagnostics for breeders 
that allow them to select new malting barleys that are resistant to skinning. Next slide, please. So despite the potential to supply all of the industry's needs, it's somewhat perplexing that despite the reputation of Scotch being based around traditional methods that must be carried out in Scotland, there's never been a requirement to use only Scottish barley in its production. There's a number of reasons for this. The industry wants a sustainable and adequate supply of high quality malting barley and is averse to the risk that could be associated with poor local annual harvests. It wants to use only optimal grains in the distilling process and is acutely aware that malting barley can often be sourced more cheaply on international markets than that produced locally. However, some, particularly independent distilleries, have made virtue of their small size and are once again starting to source barley from their local farming communities. Eilis Brewerchladi, for example, now offers individual caskings that are traceable to barley grown in the island itself. They've even started to explore locally grown heritage barleys for their production. This commitment to both local and provenance and to what effectively becomes a community product with a story attached is a good example of product placement that for the consumer is compelling and for the producer adds value. However, local production of malting barley close to individual distilleries is not always straightforward. Next slide, please. So for example, on the westerly and northern isles, manganese deficiency in the soil induces a major plant nutritional disorder that causes severe yield and quality reductions. Manganese is crucial for photosynthesis and manganese deficiency leads to a rapid reduction in oxygen production and yellowing in the leaves. So this photograph is taken at one of our small trial sites in Orkney. And while the majority of the plots are yellow due to acute manganese deficiency, if you look carefully at this photograph, you will also see that a handful appear to be performing well. And these are the heritage beer barleys that arrived on the Scottish islands some 5,000 years ago. Over time, they've adapted to cope with the low manganese in the soil, and they now grow perfectly well. In the IBH, we're trying to understand why the beer barleys perform so well in these soils, with the aim of moving the manganese efficiency traits into higher yielding, more agronomically appropriate varieties to serve the needs of the local farmers and the local industries that they supply. Next slide, please. So are these industries that are joined at the hip future-proof and will provenance and local play a more important role in a post-Brexit Scotland? Well, I would argue that there are both societal and financial benefits from adopting this approach, but there are hurdles that will need to be negotiated. So given climate change and environmental decline, farming is challenged with slashing its net carbon emissions. In the current context, this will require the development of barley varieties which have a significantly reduced carbon footprint by requiring less fertilizer, less fungicides that tolerate changes to agricultural practice and have improved tolerance to periods of drought or heavy rainfall. So these are difficult challenges. And because of that, it's important that the malting beer and whiskey industries work together with researchers, breeders and farmers and are prepared to pay a fair price for a local product that as we tra transition to a low carbon economy, may not always meet the top quality specifications that they currently demand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robbie. That's, it's really fascinating um, hearing the, about the unsung hero. Okay, uh, we've uh, reached our first poll question here. That's, that's the uh, main presentation. We have a very short one at the end, but we've reached our first poll question. Uh, and if you'd like to um, put the event code into Slido, this is a, a word cloud question and we'd like you to enter the top three words that you associate with the province of Scottish food and drink, if you would please. You start to see there the cloud develop as people have added their um, uh, thoughts are. And interestingly, as uh, or maybe not surprisingly, quality differentiation. So the bigger the word, the more people have typed it in. How welfare standards, authenticity, oh, trust. Interesting. So some interesting comments there. Okay, I will 
assume give people just uh, one more minute to, to finish their typing. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, as that um, as that develops, um, I'm going to um, open up the, um, the the floor really for questions. We've had a few questions coming, or a few questions that sort of from the discussion online. The the, the discussion opened with quite a chat there about local food and drink, and what is local? Is it is it Scottish? Is it about a region? Is it about an island? Is it about a community? Uh, and really thinking there about how um, a brand can develop in terms of local uh, provenance and local credibility. So I don't know if there's any specific questions on that. Um, certainly in Scotland, we tend to think as local as Scottish. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine, Mads Fisher-Moller, who um, is a, a colleague that's just joined us, He's uh, from, from Denmark. In Denmark, he interestingly says that scotch doesn't have any positive connotation in Denmark for the average food consumer. That's really quite interesting, apart from whiskey. Um, and actually, you know, the demands that makes us think about where is local more important in our UK market? Is scotch more important in our UK market? And the other side of the coin is what do we do to, to build that scotch piece? And that links into what uh, John said right at the very beginning about the uh, strands and work that is being developed around the recovery strategy and the, the market creation as well as the support offered to businesses to take advantage of the market. John, have you got any, I, don't, I presume you're still with us, so I can't actually see the uh, who, who's with us, but um, is that something you can comment on or have you left already? Let me try and find you. I think John might be away already. Does um, has anybody else got a comment uh, on on the local piece? I think I'm Kerry Sarah Miller here. Like what was alluded to in the chat, local means different things to different people. And the important thing when we are looking at where we place our products in the market is separating production from consumption. So what I always say is that within Scotland, we want to be producing food that is the, the right method of production in the right part of Scotland, and that we then align that with the right market for the right consumer. So the placement of the Scotch brand, almost the further away you go from Scotland, the more it sometimes means to people, but I appreciate that feedback from um, Denmark that, that doesn't have a, a high penetration, penetration there. One of the things that, that we are doing and looking at just now is the development of a, a quality um, brand mark, um, which is in our, in our current implementation plan. So there's there's work ongoing to, to relook at that and to make sure that our brands do align with what consumers are telling us that, that they're looking for. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's, you make a very good point about production methods aligned with consumers and market requirements, but taking a lead from the market and the consumer, I think is it's important. So, so that, as you've just said there, so that brings out the need for industry and um, right away across the supply chain to understand the, for it to be consumer driven rather than supply driven. Um, would you, is that something you want to make any comment on or does anybody, any of the other speakers want to make a comment on? Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a few things that have come out in terms of um, the provenance from the, from the early um, presentations we had. I mean, in terms of the salmon, we talked about that the value of the work being done not only has that impact, the positive impact on provenance, but it also impacts positively on efficiency. And same in the poultry side, Sarah, I'm sure on the QMS side, in terms of adapting and adopting the, the, the QA, and um, leads to long-term production and efficiency. Is there a link? Is there something we can, is there a link we can talk about here in terms of production efficiency and that being part of provenance? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to take that. So I think what, what work has been done so far on sustainability shows generally the more efficient you are, the more, 
efficiently you are therefore using inputs to produce an output, so the greater the sustainability. So there's, there's a clear link there. So within our um, cattle and sheep standards, for example, um, there are specific things there around um, resource use efficiency. Um, so it doesn't directly and explicitly point to sustainability, but there, there is elements in there that when you look at the data, you look at what farmers are required to do within that, would hope to move people to a more efficient place. Um, some of the work, the future work that's in development just now, we've all just seen the, the, Jim, the Jim Walker and Claire Simonetta report that was launched two weeks ago. There's some really big pieces in there about how we can make the industry and take the industry to a more sustainable future, but also make it a more efficient place to produce. So I'm quite clear that these things go very, very hand in hand. These are win-wins if we can get them right for both farm-based economics, um, they produce a better product that is then easier to place on the market and, and contributes to a better brand story. Um, and, and, and like I keep saying, we we need the product and we need the story behind the brand in order to market it. So the two absolutely have to be aligned. Thanks, Sarah. I think there's a couple of things you said there about the future and about making that part of the story of, of, the, um, of the provenance of Scottish products. I, I, I'd like to ask Dorota a question. I thought, Dorota, your comment about um, the gene banks and 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 uh, that you're developing and how that you've developed the, the red current and the blueberry on the back of consumer demand and how the market changes and that market's growing 10% year on year. You know, actually what we're seeing there is we're seeing products coming out of the market or stimulated the catalyst is market change. But then what we're actually doing potentially is protecting that provenance into the future through the work we're doing, uh, you're doing in research in terms of the gene banks. Have you got anything else you'd like to say on that, Dorota? It's, it's both ways. Uh, we preserve the traditional products and improve them. Uh, we help to make them more economic and uh, appeal more to the modern consumer, if you like. But at the same time, we look at the novel ways of bringing the food to the market. And that's why the new species appear, such as a blueberry and, and red currant. So it's a mixture, it's innovation. So we do old better and, and new as well. <laughs> Thank you, Dorota. I, th I think it's fascinating because a few of the projects have talked about that sort of protecting the provenance going forward. So not only in terms of the the sort of distributed ledger um, uh, technology um, and in terms of the, the data sets we've got, but in terms of protecting that and looking at how we really build on the fantastic problems we've got to take it forward. I would just like to ask anybody that's left, please, to before we move on to, um, if there's no more questions, uh, before we move on to, to hear from, well, there's a couple more polling questions. Um, could you put in the chat what you think the key messages and takeaway messages are from today, from the presentations you've heard today. So for an example, for me, it's in terms of there's the breadth of research um, going on. And I think we need to probably shout a little bit more about it, uh, it as, as a, a collaborative industry, as a collaborative research across Scotland. I think there's some great things there. But if people could just put in the chat what they think the key messages and takeaways are, that will give us something to, to, to work on in terms of um, future events, but also feeding back um, to, to speakers as well. And, and, and given what we've heard today, what are the priorities going forward? You know, what should, should we be doing more of? Perhaps potentially, what should we be doing less of? This will, again, it would be quite useful um, for, for um, the, the speakers and, and for the industry um, as, a, as a whole. Most of the other questions that have come up in the chat have been answered by other people in the chat, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for that. We've had some great information sharing across the different um, meat sectors and also then learning across sectors from what's gone on there. So, so again, that's fantastic. I'm sure you've all had the chance to look at that. I'd like to move on to the next slide and the next poll question, please, Callum. And the next question is about what are the most important calls to action and the needs associated with the continuation and development of the science behind Scottish provenance? So if you could type in, it's a free text answer, just type in your answer there, please. The, um, 
We've got a short, very short one slide presentation coming up next from a colleague of mine, a new colleague from my Nicola uh, Holton, who has joined us as a professor in food safety. Um, so, Carolyn, if I could ask you to just introduce one of our, our um, new initiatives within SIUC and talk a little bit about it. It's very relevant to what's been discussed today, and hopefully, again, it can, can further develop the conversation that we're having. Thank you, Nicola. Yes, thank you very much, Kerry, and thank you, everybody else who's still sat on their chairs. Hopefully, you're um, you're not too uncomfortable. <laughs> but yes, no, just very briefly, Callum, if you could move on to the next slide. Um, this is a single slide. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit in a couple of seconds um, about these new research-led challenge centres that were just launched in August um, this year. And here's a statement from Wayne Powell, our CEO for SRUC, that the challenge centres are really to support collaboration with industry and policymakers. But, and we're, what we're trying to do is meet the key challenges of today and tomorrow and use science-led advice to see you know, how we can support those challenges. But it really is all about collaboration and working with industry and policy to see what we can do um, to address these challenges. So five different challenge centres were launched. Um, and these are across the piece for SRUC. It really is covering the whole of the, the breadth of expertise there. And what I wanted to do today was just kind of officially use this event to launch our Safe and Improved Challenge Centre that I'm looking after. Sorry, Safe and Improved Food Challenge Centre. I need that coffee, Kerry. Um, and uh, just use this as a perfect platform to launch it to the external world. And um, we've heard time and time again, I think in every single talk, again and again about quality. And what we're doing really within Safe and Improved Foods is looking at quality attributes. Um, so it's absolutely central to what we're talking about today uh, with Scottish produce. And what we want to do there is to develop a research hub, um, link very closely with stakeholders and industry partners, really to address these key areas, um, priority issues, for example, emerging threats and opportunities, and look at emerging technologies. We've heard about some of those today. Um, and commercial developments as well, and then understanding the social and policy drivers and how they would impact um, safe and improved foods. So my call to you really is a plea. Um, we are here. We have a huge amount of um, expertise that we can offer, and we really want to work with um, our industry and our policy colleagues. So please do get in touch with us. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Kerry. I can't unmute myself quick enough. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I'm obviously needing that coffee too, but we're, we're almost at the end. We have got one final polling question and one thank you slide. So if you could just answer the third polling question, um, that would be great. Um, and then uh, the next question is, or the final question is, what are the top three priority areas in relation to the provenance of Scottish produce that you would like Nicola's new challenge centre for safe and improved foods to address. And remember, this is about collaboration. We will not be doing this all on our own. And some great, some great answers coming in there. So that will be really incredibly useful. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, We'll let people continue to, to answer the question, but Callum, if you could put up the uh, final slide, that would be fantastic, please. Thank you. So there you um, have contact details for myself and Nicola. Um, we're sort of two halves of SRUC, so to speak, myself from consulting and Nicola from, from research. But I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank immensely the speakers we've had today. We've had such high quality speakers. We have learned, I personally have learned so much, and I've been in the industry for 30 plus years. Uh, I think you've done really well. It was a big challenge to get a lot of information over in a short time. Uh, these webinars are great, but they do mean that we can't take a nice long day to, take, to, to impart knowledge. So thank you very much. I will be writing to all of you, but I just wanted to acknowledge the work, the effort, 
uh, and the support you have given this event today. So thank you. And also to you, the audience, for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it. We will send out this very quick evaluation and we will take on board your comments and learn from them. But um, I will also be making the recording available. Uh, but please do, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact um, the speakers through myself initially until we get the PDF of the um, presentation out and their details are on that. Uh, and we will share a PDF of the slides and any questions that you want to ask, please don't hesitate to go through them myself or Nicola using the contact details on the screen just now. Um, and uh, thank you once again to everybody. We've managed to finish 10 minutes ahead of time. That's because we didn't have a lot of discussion, but as I said, discussion doesn't stop when we, we turn off this screen. Discussion is ongoing. I think we've demonstrated today that the wealth of expertise and knowledge within Scotland, in our higher education institutes, in our main research providers, in our, our industry leadership bodies. And uh, I want to, to really just sort of have a wee cheer for that because I think it's fantastic. We've got a long way to go here with the pandemic, but what an enormously, Im immensely um, expert base on which to, to build this future and to continue to grow um, Scotland's food and drink sector. So thank you once again, everybody, and please do get in touch if you have any questions or comments. Thank you.